Hello, Anthony. Hi. Now, I hear you've just come back from f four days in prison in uh, in Israel. Is that is that true? In, yes, that uh, was Tel Aviv? my uh, that was my holiday for this year. Yes, it was. Yes. Now, now why, how did that ha come about then? How, how did you, why did you wind up in prison then? Well, I had the great fortune, or possibly it could be the misfortune, of going to a, a Palestinian solidarity campaign meeting in, in Sheffield. And it clicked to the fact I got some papers, uh, a pamphlet, two or three months earlier, just saying the Scottish Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, headed up by McNapier, was taking a, uh, a group of people, hopefully in their thousands, internationally, America, South America, Europe, to the, using the ploy to go to Palestinia, pa Palestine to give aid to uh, a group out there in Jerusalem, and to state that we're actually going to Palestine to support the Palestinians. And he realised that he'd done a smaller project the year before. This would be a great opportunity to, to defy the Israelis and to see what possible world publicity we would get. Um, so really, we realised we were taking a risk. We knew we'd be imprisoned, and uh, we knew the consequences. But it was a great... Uh, a great exploit to take part in. I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity. And, and you were in prison for what crime? You were planning violence or disruptions? We, no question of planning violence. We, we all are stuck to our instructions. The instructions were to um, hopefully bring succour to the, uh, the Palestinians if we did get through. That was a slim chance of that happening because the previous year they'd been banned. Um, we really wanted to befriend Palestinians who we support very heavily who were treated very badly by the Israeli Zionists. So you're saying your, your crime was that you supported Palestinians? That was the crime, yes, in inverted commas, yes. Right. And how did they treat you in prison? They treated us pretty well, actually. They, they, yeah, I, we, we certainly couldn't fault them. They, there was reasonable hospitality, if you can say that, after depriving us of our freedom, our movement, our association. No reading, no cameras. Um, it wasn't for the fact that we had each other, there were three others of um, British nationality that were in the cell. Um, we, what we did decide to do after the first night, when we were all a little bit confused, was to go on a hunger strike, which we took part in for four days. We didn't eat any food at all, we just had tea and coffee, which was readily available outside our cell. It was probably very similar to anybody that gets imprisoned or banged up. There was. Uh, uh, unlocking the cells, six o'clock in the morning, a head count. There was nowhere for us to go. There was razor wire everywhere. It was absolutely impossible. Lots of guards. Uh, and then we'd be locked again. We'd have um, uh, washing in the cell. There was a shower in the cell as well as a toilet. They were basically quite uh, um, functional, uh, but rudimentary, but they served our needs. We were given uh, a tracksuit, a T-shirt, and flip-flops to wear. We decided not to wear them at all. We wanted no hospitality from the Israelis who had unlawfully detained us. So we kept in mufti clothes. We had French next door. We had some Italians in the cell, or sweets as they called them, in the cell next to us. French Canadians, Americans, etc. Um, we supported each other very heavily. Unfortunately, the French rather liked the fashion statements of the uh, the, the grey tracksuits and they'd either wear them with one leg up, one leg off, both legs up. We couldn't quite understand the significance but we didn't want to use the, uh, the uniforms at all. Right. And, and did you have much uh, interaction with the guards there? A reasonable amount of interaction, yeah. The person that struck me um, was, uh, by his manner, was the prison governor. Uh, his name was Moulin Mouche. Very, very lovely man. He was a uh, he was a black man. He was probably a falasha from Ethiopia or Somalia. Um, we, we gathered that he had family. Um, he was, he, I would say he was overly friendly to me by the way he looked at us as if he understood our predicament. And when we made it very clear to him the, the first morning of our incarceration that we held no grudge against him or the guard that was with him who did the interpreting, we thought they were very fine people that had a job to do as everybody has to do and there's authority above them that would make it difficult. But certainly I would say almost all of the time he showed solidarity with us and pleasantness. He put his arm around me at one occasion. I put my arm around him and teased him. He adopted me as his father and he told the other guard he called me my father. 
and I thought that was very sweet and very sentimental. And for the rest of the, the week, he was on duty most of the time, day and night. Um, he, he had no difficulty with any of the behaviour from anybody, I think, because we all respected him a lot. There was no way that his behaviour would have been modified by his superiors. It was his nature, and I think he bred that sort of nature with the guards that he controlled. And so that was a great relief. He was very disappointed when we told him we didn't want to accept his uh, um, kindness, or the state's kindness, by perhaps feeding us generously with certainly a majority of the food coming from the West Bank, the peppers, the, uh, the, the oranges, the apples. We told him that clearly, so he understood that. So he knew why we were disagree why we disagreeable and uh, upset with the way we were being treated. But we knew we couldn't do anything about it, we didn't hold it to blame. Uh, several of the other, one or two of the others anyway, were, were pretty hostile when we had to march with them or walk with them amongst the other huts, one on the side of the prisons, to go and see the lawyer and also the British consul. We felt that they were quite antagonistic and they were certainly anti what our purpose was, and that was to have a free passage through uh, Israel from Tel Aviv to into Jerusalem or Nazareth. One of the greatest aspects was when, with trepidation, we saw the lawyer, who almost certainly would have been Israeli. In fact, he introduced himself as an Israeli-Palestinian, and that really uh, quickened our hearts and mm. gave us uh, a lot of gladness. And the fact that these people recognised and stated quite clearly in the confines of rather a strict, to put it uh, in mild terms, of a, uh, an Israeli institution, where if their intentions or their patronage of us had have seeped out, it might have led to repercussions for them. But he stood up and took my hand very graciously and said at the end of our interview um, with his hand on his heart that his family had lived for generations in Nazareth and any time, day or night, that we wanted to come, either me or my family, he would give us his warmth and his hospitality. And so, uh, but would you, would you be allowed in to, to visit him? Unfortunately, I wouldn't. He knew that and I knew that. But yeah. the day might come when this might be possible. And... Uh, it was wonderful, wonderful. So how much did you actually get to see of Palestine then? Uh, none at all, unfortunately. Yeah, none yeah. at all. The only glimpses I saw of Palestine, I referred to as Israel, was when I looked out at the small bullet holes which were in the armoured mm. vehicle that transported us to our prison and then to our holding centre, was a sign of uh, Jerusalem and Lod, and, uh, and that was about all we saw. And we mm. saw a few uh, palm trees and... Uh, uh, mimosa trees, I think. That's unfortunate we saw. So, um, if it was possible, you would like to go back then? Would I you? would love to go back there with my hand on my heart. I would love to go there. I'm very envious of people that can spend time working in humanitarian, humanitarian relief as a group from Sheffield are at the moment. So I'm very, very envious of them. So uh, my heart is with you and I'm madly jealous of you having the opportunity to do it. So you, so you spend all this money and you, you got four, you know, four days in prison for it. Do you, do you think it was worth it? Do you, what, well, what do you think you achieved? There's absolutely no question of it. I mean, advertising companies will tell you the millions and millions they pay to get their message over. Well, mm. the amount of money I paid was very, very negligible for the, uh, the, the tsunami, really, that has um, followed our trip over. Mm. A local MP has done everything possible to facilitate my relief. I've met him most days, which has been very courteous, very helpful, asking me how my family situation is, how this is, how that is. That's a great, great plus. I've been in the local newspaper, free publicity. Unfortunately, uh, BBC Sheffield, perhaps it's because I'm an outsider and I'm Derby rather than uh, Yorkshire, uh, and also the fact that he said uh, before we conduct the interview I'll have to have a word with my superior, so I have a feeling that it might be the BBC up to his usual tricks that mm -hmm. didn't get me space or airtime with BBC Sheffield. So, that's a minor problem, but yes, absolutely worthwhile. I'll do it again next year, and I certainly will, yes. But uh, so after your interaction with the, with the prison governor there, do you, do you think peace is possible for, for Palestinians and Israelis? That's uh, very difficult for me to ask. I'm not an intellectual. I would go by my feelings. Um, it could be so. There are lovely people in Israel, there are lovely people in Palestine. It just depends on the leadership, the Zionist influence, the way they're curtailing people like myself now who are 
I am legitimate, of course, but if I was somebody going on a pilgrimage next week and they discovered that something wasn't quite rare with them, then they'd take them off the pilgrimage. If I was going with a group of friends who really just want to look in the Holy Land, be it Israel or Palestine, I think that would be, that would be difficult to do, although we'd make great friends with both of those particular um, groups of people. It could be, it could be, but what's best, a two-state solution or a solution where it's one state where everybody can live in harmony, which of course it should be. So perhaps that might happen in 10, 15, 20 years after they solve the problems in Iran. That's a big $64,000 question. It's a very sad situation, but we pray, whatever religion we are, that things will come to a head and people will live peacefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.